Hi, my name is Hazem, and today we're going to continue with our course on rigging equipment. So, how do we choose rigging equipment? We gotta ask a few questions. So, first of all, how much does the object weigh? What's the shape? Where's the center of gravity? What kind of equipment is available, and what is its condition? Where is the load located? How are we attaching it? And that's it basically. But we need to think about two more things. One is in our rig, we've got we will have a number of different pieces of equipment as you will see. And the maximum weight we can lift is 20% of the braking strength of the weakest part of the hardware. So for example, if our chain is rated for a thousand pounds, then the maximum we should be lifting with it is 20% or 200 pounds. That gives us a safety factor of one to five. And then if we are lifting a human being, then our safety factor needs to be 10 to one. So if we are, if our chain breaks at a thousand pounds, we should only be lifting a hundred pounds. And every device that we use must have the load rating stamped on it. So, when we're lifting, um, we have to go back to physics and think about the angle of, of the lift. So, in, in this case, imagine we have a box or a beam or something that weighs a thousand pounds <laughs> and we're lifting it straight up that means that our sling is so in this in the case on the left here we've got uh, a sling with two sides and so each side is approximately 500 pounds now that's assuming we can lift these two straight up in this case uh, this is a very hard thing to do. Typically, we'll have a a rig with a, a single point of contact that's lift that's doing the lifting. So as we can see here, the bigger the angle, the less um, force is exerted. So because we want to know what the upward force is. So when the angle here is sixty degrees. Each rope is experiencing 577 pounds of force because the downward force of gravity has to equal the upward force of the, which is a thousand pounds. And now, since we've introduced this angle, part of the force is horizontal. So you can see when we're at 30 degrees. We've actually doubled the force on our sling. So now, even though we're lifting a thousand pounds straight up, we have a thousand pounds of tension in our rope on each side. And so this could be a dangerous situation if our rope is not uh, designed to carry that load. So the recommended sling angle is 60 degrees. The 60 degrees gives us a uh, optimal. Uh, so it's pretty close to 500 pounds in this case. So it's pretty close to being uh, completely vertical. So the way that we get 60 degrees, this is a equilateral triangle, which means each side has an equal distance and that gives us an equal angle and so to get that what we want to do is the distance between our two attachment points on our load must be equal to the length of the rope and you can easily figure that out so say if your rope is 10 feet long then you want to keep your two ropes 10 feet apart and if you know the center of the object 
you can just divide by two. So say your rope is 10 feet long, you divide by two and you get five feet, and then you just measure five feet to the left of the center and five feet to the right of the center, and you get uh, your two attachment points. Make sense? If you got any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask. Now, the second thing that we want to think about is the center of gravity. And center of gravity can be calculated, but basically, um, when we have an object that's completely uniform, then the center of gravity is in the center of the object. But when we have an object that's um, that's got an odd shape, or one where the density is different, so for example, if you think of a car, a car uh, has most of the weight is in the engine, which is at the front of the car. So the center of gravity shifts towards where the where more of the weight is. So a car's center of gravity is not the center of the car. It's closer to the front of the car and closer to to the um, to the ground than the roof. So when we have an object with a center of gravity that is not in the center of the object, um, and if, so if we we want to align our sling with the center of gravity. So if the sling is not in the center of gravity, then this object will tend to sway. So for example, if the, the center of gravity was way on the left, then this thing, this object is going to tend to fall to the left. So we want to determine the center of gravity and put our sling exactly center to that, and we can do that with a leveler. Now, if we look here, remember one of the things that we can use are eye bolts. So, eye bolts are what hold up our load, so they connect our load to our our, um, our rigging equipment and eye bolts come in different standard diameters from a quarter of an inch all the way to one and a quarter inch and this table gives us the safe working load of the eye bolt so and the safe working load depends on the angle so if we're pulling if we're lifting straight up vertically then we use the vertical column if we're 75 degrees, uh, we use a 75 degree column. And then if we're doing 60 degrees, we use a 60 degree column and then 45. And we never want to use an angle less than 45. So if we look here, a quarter inch bolt can do 550 pounds straight up. But as soon as we get to 60 degrees, it can only do 175 pounds. So we want to think about, so if you know your angle that you're lifting at, and you know your weight, so you come down here and say, say I'm lifting uh, 2,000 pounds at 60 degrees. So I come down to my uh, 60 degree angle column, and I go down to 2,000 pounds, so there is no 2,000 pounds. So the next highest is um, is right here. This is probably a typo. This should be 2520, but we picked a bad example. So let's say let's say we're lifting um, let's say we're lifting at 75 degrees and 3,000 pounds we've got a 3,000 pound load and we're lifting 75 degrees so we come down to our 75 degree column and then we go down to there's no 3,000 you're probably not going to get exact so you go to the next one up so the next one up is 3960 so we find the bolt and we go across and we say oh we need a 7 8 bolt so that's how we choose a bolt now we can also use a shackle so 
The diameter of the bow tells us the size of the shackle. And you'll notice here that the pen, the pen is what gives us the size of the, the pen is always larger than the shackle. So the pen is 1 16th of an inch larger than the bow, between 1 16th and 1 quarter of an inch. So that depends on the size of the bow. But there are six main types of shackles. The first one is a screw pen, which uh, you just, it, it's threaded right into the bow. There's also a round pen, which is held with a clevis pen. And then we've got the safety type shackles, which uh, use a bolt and not, and not, and a clevis pen to hold the, the, the bow, to hold the pen in place, I mean. And then these are repeated with with chain type shackles. So we've got anchor type shackles which are round, and then we've got chain shackles which are U shaped. Now remember, earlier we were looking at rings and and links for chains. So again, we can look at rings which have no welds. They're made out of alloy steel in the factory, and they come in different sizes with a standard stock diameter and then a standard inside diameter so between four and six inches and they have a maximum working load of between 7,000 and 19,000 pounds so if you want to know if you've got a load you pick you figure out how many pounds you're lifting and then you come down to the column and then you go across to see the diameter and we've also got pear-shaped links which come in many more sizes and we've also got hooks the hooks you gotta be careful with a hook because uh, your your chain can slip off the hook if it's not if there's not enough tension so We've got a number of different hooks, including high, clevis, and we've got grab hooks, we've got sorting hooks. Uh, the, the lock ones are, are really good because your load won't slip off. And so we look at what we call a mousing. The mousing tells us how the hook secures. So we've got one with a spring latch. This is just a standard spring loaded latch and then we've got one with a mechanical latch which requires a, a little bit more action to release so just pushing on it won't release you have to it's like a, a three-step process and then we've got a mouse hook so again the angle of the hook determines the capacity of the hook so once we start to angle the hook a slightly, uh, we already a slight angle reduces our load by 14%, and a 45 degree angle reduces our load by 40 by 60%. So we want to be careful to understand the angle or try not to angle our hook. Now an important thing is also within our bolt we can have a swivel the swivel lets us turn the load without twisting the line and it also lets the line twist without moving the load which is good because sometimes you're picking up a load and you need to turn it when you put it down it doesn't always it can't always go exactly parallel to the way you picked it up so having a swivel is really important now, when we are lifting, we can add an eye bolt, and so we have a hook here, and then we've got our chains, and then we've got our eye bolts. And because sometimes we are lifting from a single point, but it's not practical to attach a single hook to our load. Our load might be big and bulky or 
it might not have an anchor point right in the center of gravity. So we can use spreader bars or equalizer beams to spread our load. So in this case, we have a spreader bar. So now we've got two points of attachment of our load, even though we've only got one um, hoist. With an equalizer beam, we've got one point of attachment, but we've got two hoists. And this could be in a situation where one hoist is not strong enough to lift uh, the item or where we have uh, multiple or we want to lift at an angle. So supports, sometimes when we have a load that's susceptible to crushing or difficult to hang, handle, then we want to use a spreader bar. And part of it is also, see the spreader bar has now reduced our angle by a significant amount. So we no longer need to, to use a, a stronger or higher rated uh, lifting equipment. Now, if you make a cut, if you get this from the factory, a spreader bar, it'll tell you what it's rated for. But if you do a custom spreader bar, then you must have it certified by an engineer. Now, we also use blocks. So blocks help us move a load that is bigger than the safe working capacity of the rope. And we can use these with a hoist or a chain. And the reason is because the, the block has sheaves, multiple sheaves, and the rope passes through these sheaves. And so they reduce the actual load to the point so we can cut the load by a third by by two thirds. So or we divide by three basically. So if our rope is rated for a thousand pounds, we can use this now to lift three thousand pounds because the load is being transferred now from the rope to the actual uh, center pin of the of the block. Now you'll notice here there's a sheave. So the sheave is what carries the rope. And we have to be careful to choose a sheave that is the right size and shape for the rope that we're using. And notice that the sheave will wear out the rope after a while. So we must make sure to inspect the rope. Now if we look here, here's a sheave. And we can use a gauge to figure out the uh, groove of the sheave and so there's three things that we want to see the first is the tread diameter which is the width of the sheave and then the second thing is the pitch diameter which is from the center point of the rope to the center point of the rope and then obviously we have the outside diameter and then on the vertical width we can see the, the width is the width of the sheave, and then the throat size is the internal width of the sheave, and the diameter is the diameter of the rope that's in the sheave. Now, the rope will wear and the groove will wear. So if we have a brand new sheave and a brand new rope, they fit nice and snug, but after a while, if you keep pulling on the rope, you start to grind away at the at the sheave, and now the rope has some gaps, but but it fits okay at the bottom because the rope is worn out too. So the rope the rope and the and the groove fit nice and snug. But now you add a, new, a brand new rope to to an existing uh, sheave. It doesn't fit. You have this gap now because the rope is much wider, and so you've worn out part of the part of the sheave. Now that's okay, though. So what you want to look at is figure out what diameter your sheave is. So from five sixteenths to 
2 and 5 sixteenths. And then you want to measure the distance between the rope and the bottom of the groove. And see if the groove diameter exceeds the rope diameter. Now, you the, the maximum you, you can have depends on the diameter. So if you're 5 sixteenths or less, then you can't have more than one. 128th of an inch spacing and then if you got a really big sheave then you can have 1 16th of an inch but for new or regrooved sheaves uh, the tolerance is a bit higher so you can you can regrind this and then it'll fit again but you can go up to an eighth of an inch gap Okay, now we're going to look at turnbuckles. So a turnbuckle is used to tension the rope and it is made from alloy steel and the hook and the turnbuckle must have safety latches. So it must be secure. Now, here's a turnbuckle. We've got different combinations. We can have jaws, we can have eyes, and we can have hooks. So when you when you attach a um, a jaw or an eye, do not use a jam nut. You want to use a a lock wire, and this keeps the turnbuckle from turning. Now you always want to check for damage to threads. So if you're threading a hook or a um, because these thread into the turnbuckle. So we don't want the threads to loosen. That's that's basically our situation. If this turns too much, the, the threads will come out and our 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 eye or our jaw or our hook will fall right off. So we want to look for cracks and we want to look for damaged threads. Now, if we're lifting more than 2,000 kilos, then only qualified people should be lifting and they need to have a clear training which could include how to operate the lifting device properly uh, how to read and understand lift plans how to maintain equipment and the log book how to choose appropriate accessories determine the number of parts required understand device limits inspect the device use load charts properly perform daily maintenance, how to shut the device down, and how to use hand signals. Now, every there's standard charts for lifting. I've, we've looked at some charts, but when we're close to or over 75% capacity, so if you're lifting 1,000 pounds, if your equipment's rated for, let's say, 10,000 pounds, and you're lifting 5,000, then you say, no brainer, just lift it. But if you're lifting like 8,000 pounds, then you want to sit down because you're over 75%. So you want to sit down and actually calculate the angles and the, the loading and make sure you're actually not taking the risk that you're over because you could be over the limit. Now, when we are lifting, we want to have what we call a tag line. And the tag line tells us so we must never touch the load when it's being lifted. And we must never stand under the load. But if we want to move the load or stop it from turning, like if we've got a swivel, then we attach a tag line. So the tag line is like a rope. And then we can, we can be standing. A safe distance from the load. Any questions, please post a comment. Thank you.